Conversations with Nikki is brought to you by studyapps.co.za, South Africa's leading education app for tablets. Well, welcome, welcome, and thank you for joining me once again for yet another interesting conversation. My name is Nikki Seberini, and you are listening to Conversations with Nikki. And I assure you that today you are going to be inspired, you are going to be entertained, and uh, you may even be challenged by my guest that I have in the studio today. Now, I don't know if you read these books, these motivational books. I don't know if you're inspired by people who have achieved extraordinary things. I know that Albert Einstein once said, there comes a time when the mind takes a higher plane of knowledge but can never prove how it got there. And Aristotle said, you'll never do anything in this world without courage. It's the greatest quality of the mind next to honor. Henry Ford said, if you think you can do something, or if you think you can't, you're probably right. I don't know what these words mean to you. I mean, do they resonate deeply? Is it just uh, something lovely to listen to and you're motivated for a short period of time and then you move on? Or you're trying to live your life in each and every day thinking about these kind of words. How do we apply our minds and how do we achieve as individuals the extraordinary? Well, my guest today has done just that. And I know you are going to be so inspired by him. I'd like to welcome into the studio today a man that I first heard about many years ago. Well, I think it was in 2000. It was a few months after he had done the deed. Um, And the deed was plunging headfirst in just a speedo into the ice-cold waters on the North Pole, Um, waters um, sitting at around about minus 1.7 degrees. And he came out after swimming a kilometer alive and well. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, how is it possible. It's not possible. Any other person to do who, who tried to do something like that would not be able to walk out alive. So I've been following his star. He, he didn't know that, but I have been following his star. So when I heard that he had read, uh, he had just written a new book, 21 Yaks and a Speedo, How to Achieve Your Impossible. And I knew he was coming up to Joburg. I thought I had to grab him with both hands. And of course, I'm talking about Lewis Pugh, maritime lawyer, pioneer swimmer, an ocean advocate and leading inspirational speaker. How are you, Lewis? Very good, thank you. Thank you for joining me today. It's lovely having you in the studio. So you've been very busy promoting your book. Yes, so we did a tour last week in Cape Town, today uh, and and yesterday in Johannesburg and now off to Durban and Peter Maritzburg. But hard work doesn't really scare you, does it? Um, I I, I don't find promoting a book hard work. I I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's taken me nine months to write this book and this is a day that I've been dreaming about for many for you know for nine months but this is not your first book this of course we know is your second book um, the, the first book was uh, the story of your life really and yes. about uh, the all the achievements um, achieving the impossible what made you write the book I mean you're still very much in the middle part of your life you're still achieving so much the, you know I, I'm an ocean advocate I'm, I'm campaigning for the protection of the oceans you know, there there are a number of ways I can get my message out. It's either through through interviews or it's through my swims, symbolic swims, and also through writing. And so I wanted to write a story to hopefully inspire people to protect their, the oceans. This new book, though, 21 Yaks and a Speedo, it takes it a step further. It's talking about 21 of my expeditions. They're 21 short stories. And we tell stories about how uh, you can achieve your own impossible, whatever that may be. Okay, so we're going to come back to the book yeah. because people are going, yaks, what's a yak? But you'll put us out of our misery in, in, a, in a short while. Yes. But what an extraordinary life you have lived. I mean, you were born in the UK, yeah. and when you were 10 years of, uh, old, you came over to South Africa. Why? Um, I think it had, a lot, it had a lot to do with my father. He loved warm, warm weather. Uh, I put it as Who doesn't? As that. Who doesn't? <laughs> uh, it was a time in Britain which, when Britain was going through a difficult period. Uh, there were a lot of a lot of strikes. Uh, South Africa seemed to be an actually wonderful place, and his mother had been South African, and so he sort of wanted to return. I think perhaps to his roots, and so we we, we packed up and we sailed all the way from from Bristol all the way to Cape Town. I remember arriving mm-hmm. in Cape Town, and we arrived late in the evening, and Table Mountain was lit up. And this almost, I don't have it understand, too nostalgia, but it almost felt like, you know, like an immigrant arriving in New York and you see the Statue of Liberty. Mm. This was Africa. And uh, it was very exciting as a young boy arriving here. 
But but you, I know that you've always questioned. I mean, you've got roots. You've got your heart your heart in both countries, really. Mm. But when you first arrived in South Africa, apart from seeing this beauty, did you feel a root, a connection at all to this land when you first arrived? Uh, but perhaps not. So you know, when when you move, when you emigrate, it takes a little bit of time to assimilate. Mm. I was very very different. The schooling had been very different in England. Um, but it's hard not to fall in love with Africa. I remember the very first thing which my father did was he took us to all the national parks. <laughs> you must have Elef- loved that. Yes, I mean, as a young boy, you know, when you drive into the Addo Elephant National Park and you're surrounded by elephants, it is slightly different to to Dartmoor where you're surrounded by sheep. <laughs> so it, 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 it was hard not to fall in love with this place and very, very quickly. Also, I mean, what really stood out for you was the schooling, because I mean, mm. you were then you you settled in Grahamstown, yes. and you, was it St Andrews? I was at St this Andrews. This terrible, te- well, I'm not going to say terrible school, because in the book, in your in, in your first book, yeah. you know, you said there are many people who had fantastic experiences, but mm. you were terribly, terribly bullied. Well, you know, I don't think I was bullied. You and I, others. Yeah, I don't think I was bullied any more than than than, than, than anyone next to me. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to dwell too much on it, but I th- uh, the lesson I took away from it is that. Every single one of us is very different. And there'll be one school which will be right for you, and there'll be one school which perhaps isn't right for you. Uh, when I left St. Andrews College, I went to Camps Bay High School in Cape Town. Mm-hmm. Now, this was a very, very different experience. Uh, St. Andrews was perhaps quite rigid, and, and, and Camps Bay, I remember arriving there on the first day, and our classroom overlooked the Atlantic Ocean. Oh. I remember looking down onto the beach. What a dream. And... I had always, as a young boy, wanted to go to Antarctica, and I remember looking out across the beach and thinking, 5,000 kilometers south of here is Antarctica, and I desperately want to go there. And I spent the next three years looking out of the classroom, and we had the most inspirational headmaster. He knew the names of every single person in the mm. school, all, all 600. He knew every name of every parent. He was a leader uh, like I have never, ever met before. And he inspired everybody in that school. And it's wonderful to see what a lot of the pupils from that school have gone on to achieve. So actually in my class, uh, because we look, overlooked the sea, one of them became the world surfing champion, another one's a professional sailor. So a lot of them have got, have got roots in the oceans now. Mm. But what you've said and what you've highlighted is really important is a mentor, um, to have someone to look up to. So if someone yes. is leading, um, you want to follow. And I know that your, your late father mm. had a huge impact mm. and has, has always been a great influence in all the decisions that you've taken in your life. Yes, I mean... I, I, the older you get, the more you realize how very lucky you are when you see mm-hmm. people who perhaps haven't had that, that background. I was very lucky. I had a, a, both, both parents were hugely instrumental to me. My mother, uh, she loved reading. She would read me history books in the evening before I went to bed. She'd mm-hmm. tell me about all the great explorers, etc. My father wasn't, wasn't that hands-on, but he, um, uh, he was... Uh, well, he, yeah. was, he was very involved in the military, yes. and that inspired you, I mean, when you became a, a reservist for the SAS. Yes. So my father served in the Royal Navy, so uh, he, he was just a w- wonderful father. Mm. You Unfortunately, know, he, he, you lost him at a, at a young age. I, I lost him when he passed away when I think I was 21 or 22, but mm. effectively uh, he passed away when I was much younger because he got Alzheimer's disease, and for any of the listeners who've, who perhaps had a relative who's got Alzheimer's disease, you'll realize that you know what a, what a dreadful disease it is and it uh, has a lasting impact on everyone around uh, but Louis, your father used to share lots of stories with you he was a good storyteller and you're such a good storyteller I mean I was saying that to you before the interview started I think that's what's so riveting um, about your books is that you, you, you take the reader right along with you and, and, and we feel like we're part of this fantastic adventure but I see it comes from your dad um, when, when he explained I mean wasn't he there for the, the, the first blasting of, of the atomic bomb Yes, my father was at the first British atomic bomb test. But, I, you know, I, my father was a great storyteller. <clears throat> but I think it's an African tradition. Mm-hmm. So if you think about Africans, and this is one of the, the things I love about this continent, is that Africans, they love telling stories, and they're very, very good at it. So they don't have a strong written tradition. But when you think about telling stories around mm-hmm. a campfire, they are absolutely excellent at it. And, you know, I've had the privilege of, of, of working with Archbishop Desmond Tutu on a commission of inquiry. I remember s- sitting behind him and him starting to tell a story and he slowly builds it up and then he gets more and more and more excited and then he starts laughing and he pulls everybody in and then he comes in with a big punch at the end and then he leaves and that's the art of leaves of leaving people wanting more absolutely mm. i mean that's one of the the, the arts of public speaking are number one drop the powerpoint you know the gettysburg address and all the great speeches in the world were not done 
uh, with those things that were just told from the heart. Mm. Number two, make sure you speak from the heart. Speak from a place of, of, of real passion and authority. And number three, make sure that when you speak, you have stopped speaking before everyone has stopped listening. Mm-hmm. Uh, or too often people speak for too long. But did you apply all of this before or after your TED talk? You, Ted, Ted, <laughs> Ted is an amazing... I mean, Ted is just fantastic. Yeah, I mean, just to, just to explain to some of the listeners who perhaps don't know what Ted is, it, it was started many, many years ago, and it is short speeches, and initially they were 18 minutes, and they were, quote-unquote, ideas that would change the world. It started in America, and then they had one conference in America, one in, in Oxford in England, and then the, the, the speeches were put onto video, and they were put free on the Internet. And now there's been a sudden explosion. Now there are other events all over the world. And what's lovely is that the style of it is storytelling. Mm. Mm. So it is and people. everyone has access to it. And it's free. Mm. And so you can, you can see some of the most dynamic uh, ideas, whether they're on education, on health care, on leadership, on, on, on any subject. Just go onto the Internet and go TED.com, T-E-D.com. And so I did two speeches for TED. I, I did one uh, after I did the North Pole Swim, which was 18 minutes. And then they asked me to trial out a nine-minute speech. So they said, you know, these are on the Internet. People actually don't have time for, for 18 minutes. Could you trial out a nine-minute one? And doing a shorter Could speech you? is much harder. Mm. But it went successfully, and now they're even trialing out a five-minute speech. And I think it's a good idea because if you can't tell people what you're about – and what your idea is in less than five minutes, well, then you need to sit down. Oh, but it's the story. Come on, Lewis, it's the story. You've got to embellish on the details. We want to hear more. We want, we want the full story because you've got so many fascinating stories to share. In such a short space of a time, you've achieved so much, really. So, so sitting at Camps Bay and looking out and dreaming about swimming in Antarctica and mm. just, no, you know. No, I didn't dream about swimming in Antarctica. I didn't dream. Oh, oh, oh just visiting? Was yes, it just yes. to visit? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I, I mean, you must remember this was sort of 1987, um, and I had my first swimming lesson the year before. So I'd grown up in England. So how old were you in 1987? Oh, gosh. So I was about sort of six, 16, 17. And you didn't know how to swim up until that point. I, I could, found I, that I hard could, to believe. I could swim, mm-hmm. but I, I had no had no training. So I remember there was one classroom where you could see Robben Island. I remember looking out and thinking, and a friend of mine, Laurie Fialkoff, had swum Robben Island. And I don't know even to this day where the idea where it germinated, but I just thought, right, I'm going to swim Robben Island. And there was a swimming pool there, and there was a guy called Paul Barrett-Smith who trained people. And so I went to him and I said, Paul, I want to swim Robben Island. So he said, well, jump in. He put me into the slow lane, where I remained for some time, and... He trained me for a month, and then I just lost patience. And I persuaded the Cape Long Distance Swim Association to take me out to Robben Island. I started the swim, and you really realized how woefully underprepared I was. You were 17. Yeah, I was 17, but the other thing was I was very, very thin. So I've, I've, I've bulked out a little bit in, in, in the meantime. But you need, to be, you need to have a little bit of uh, body fat on you when you're, when you're swimming. Robin Island, the water's cold. So when did you actually fall in love with swimming? Is uh, it swimming or is it the sea that you love, the ocean? Both. Both. I mean, when it, when, so, so, so PT lessons at Camps Bay High School, you go play touch rugby on the beach mm-hmm. and then you'd cool down Tough afterwards day. by diving in the ocean. And I just love those sort of first ten strokes when you go underneath the wave and then that, that fresh feeling. And just you didn't feel the cold at that stage? I did feel the cold. This is one of the misconceptions. People think, well, because you swim across the North Pole, you swim on Mount Everest in a glacial lake, the waters have been even below zero, you must love cold. Nonsense. It's, I tolerate the cold. Anybody who loves cold hasn't been cold before. They really haven't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing more painful. There, there are people who probably think that all you've done your whole life is be an adventurer and a long-distance swimmer and yeah. travel from country to country and also speak out um, against climate change and, and yeah. the, the conserving our oceans. Yeah. But you've done a lot more because you studied law. Yes. And I find that very interesting because you had a, a, a quite a long period of time when you were a lawyer, but you turned your back on that. Yes. And that must have been a very, very difficult decision to make. I haven't quite turned my back on it, but, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a professional lawyer uh, at, at the moment. It, it was a difficult decision. Uh, you know that sun, well, perhaps you don't know it, but there's that feeling on a Sunday afternoon where you think, oh, I'm going back to work on Monday, and I'm really, I really don't want to be there. I want to be somewhere else. 
And I was beginning to feel that. I was working on a number of very, very big oil pollution cases and, 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 and some cargo cases as a maritime lawyer in a big, big law firm in London. And then I was very lucky. A friend of mine at school, was his name was David Becker. We were standing outside St. Paul's Cathedral, and I said to him I wanted to go to the Arctic because my parents had told me about these great explorers. They told me about the polar bears. Neither of them had been there, but they told me the stories about it. And I said to David, I just want to go to the Arctic. And he said to me, Lewis, it's so important that you follow your own dreams in life because if you don't, you're going to be following somebody else's. And imagine getting all the way to the end of your life to realize, gosh, I've just been following somebody else's dreams. And that was just a little sort of lapel-shaking moment which I needed in my life. I dreamt of going to this island called Svalbard, which means cold coast in Norway, in Norwegian. And it's, it's halfway between the top of Norway and the North Pole. It's deep in the Arctic Circle. I packed my bags and off I went there. Just like that? Yeah, I mean, it, it was the right moment in my life. Fear? Uh, I, I w- Did, was fear there at all? There was fear but not panic. There's a big distinction between fear and panic. Okay, yeah. let's let find the, show me the distinction. Fear is healthy. Mm-hmm. Panic is deadly. So if something is a little bit frightening, that means you're pushing your boundaries. You're growing. You should be moving towards fear. Fear is your friend. Uh, mit- just bear in mind, mitigate against all the risk. Mm-hmm. So I had a little bit of money. Uh, so I had, a, had some savings, and I thought, let's just go off there for three months. Well, it, it ended up a little bit longer than three months. And, and then every year I thought, I'll go back to law, I'll go back to law. But I was just enjoying it too much. And then I really found my true passion, which was I just loved swimming. And I suppose that, that it must have been quite worrying for my mother because, you know, I'd, I'd, um, she'd paid for me to go through University of Cape Town and qualify as a lawyer. And then I went off to Cambridge University and did a master's. And then I've been working at a top city law firm. And then I say to her, well, I want to swim. Hmm. Turning my back. Well, you say not turning your back, but anyway. <laughs> and it, and it, her response was interesting. It was, you, you know, just just go for it, Lewis. And I didn't know how it was going to pan out, but I just enjoyed it so much that, that I kept on doing it. And then came the moments where, after swimming in many different places around the world, over a number of years, I started seeing the, the way they were changing, principally because of climate change. And then there was that... Uh, the environment changing. Yes, I mm. mean, so so in terms of, especially, especially in the Arctic, you see glaciers melting, you see sea ice disappearing, uh, you see plastic pollution all over the beaches. I mean, this is far away from us. You know, some of the beaches in northern Svalbard are over a thousand kilometers away from the nearest habitation, and you go to them, and there's plastic all over them. We're having such a dramatic impact on the environment. And so also the whale bones you described, that, that yes. terrific beach with all of those, yes. those whale bones, so this skeletons. Was, so this was on the other end of the world. This was Antarctica mm. where there was widespread whaling you mm. know, at the turn of the century. And in one place called Deception Island where they used to kill all the whales, all the whale bones are left there. And it's a sort of, uh, I like to think that it's a reminder of man's folly. Uh, luckily, luckily, the world realized what they were doing all too late. They passed legislation, and now, you, now you, you know you're not legally allowed to commercially hunt for whales. But um, so all this happened, and then luckily I was able to sort of dovetail these passions. Number one was for swimming, mm. and number two, I realised because my father and mother had taken me to all these national parks as a young boy, was how important that was to me. Mm. So there was a purpose. It, yes. it, you, it gave your swimming and the, the passion for swimming a purpose. When I first started swimming, none of the famous landmarks in the world had been swum, other than English Channel, straight to Gibraltar, Robben Island, and a few others. And so I had this desire to go out there and sort of push boundaries like the old explorers and, and, and try to be the first to swim in various places. And there were two other swimmers doing it at the same time. One was a lady called Lynn Cox, uh, an American lady, a fantastic swimmer. The other one was a guy called Martin Strell. He swam down all the rivers. He swam a section of the Amazon. He swam the, the Mississippi, mm. the Yangtze, etc. I came onto the scene a little bit later. I was left with all the bloody cold stuff. <laughs> so, so, so I was pushed to, you know, the, the Arctic and the Antarctic. And, yeah, that's... You were, ha- you were happy to take up the challenge. Are you a competitive person? I, I hate... Comp- Did it drive you that well, there were these yeah. other two who were exploring and, and, and doing things? It, it wasn't an official race. It, it wasn't a, like Captain Scott and Amundsen trying to become the first people to go to the, to get to the South Pole. Not that that was an official race. 
But I think we all felt acutely aware that there were very few landmarks left and that, you know, Mm. if you wanted them, it was the first there to get them. If you have just tuned in, well, welcome. My name's Nikki Severini, and this is Conversations with Nikki. And I'm having such an interesting conversation with Lewis Pugh. He's in the studio. We're going to be talking in a moment about his new book, 21 Yaks and a Speedo, How to Achieve Your Impossible. And Lewis really has achieved what many of us um, would deem the impossible um, time and time again. So we'll continue with the conversation in just a moment. But statistics show that if students do not review what they've learned, they will forget 70% within an hour and 84% within 48 hours. The key to effective long-term learning is testing. Um, Do you need more proof that Study Apps is the market leader in revision and test preparation? Study smarter, not harder, with studyapps.co.za. And of course, Conversations with Nikki is proudly brought to you by studyapps.co.za. So, Lewis, you have this passion. Um, you have a purpose. You want to. Um, you're very passionate about the swimming and the environment, and you're combining both of them. You have the challenge of these other two swimmers who are achieving great things, and you have done just that. You've achieved something that other, another human being has not. So the question that I have to ask you is: that what drives you every day? And when you wake up in the morning, do you say, because there was a period when I was reading in your book, when you, when you did so much within a short period of time, I mean, you were, you were just putting a tick in every single box. Mm. Well, what is it? What is it that drives you? Do you wake up and go, but hang on, I haven't done this yet. Or let me do it before someone else does. Or what, 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 what's driving you? When I started out, it, it was pure and simple. I wanted to be the first to do the swims around these famous landmarks. You know, it was like being Edmund Hillary in the 1950s before Everest had been climbed. And I was just very, very lucky in that period of human history where over a period of sort of 10, 20 years, all the famous landmarks got taken. Mm. And I remember uh, the last sort of the last big swim, you know, all the swimmers had talked about this holy grail of swimming. The first person to do a swim in every ocean of the world, a long distance swim in every ocean of the world. And what made it so difficult was that it was going to you'd have to do one in the Arctic. And you'd have to do one in the Southern Ocean, both of which are extremely cold. And swimmers all talk about swimming in a speedo cap and goggles. You know, we don't use wetsuits. And this made it what people thought was a holy grail, absolutely impossible. So I went and did all those. I remember the final swim I did in the Pacific Ocean. I decided to do it in Sydney Harbour. And I finished it. And it was this immense feeling of satisfaction. We had been through many years through the, through the, the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian, the Pacific, the, the Southern and, 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 and the Arctic. But then, so what? Mm. You mean what? So, so what? Mm. You know, you, you're the first. Well, really? Yes. It, 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 it began you mean there are no bright lights? There's no I mean, bells it, ringing? Well, it, momentarily. It, it, it was... Ab- we felt delighted because it had been such a hard journey and so many people had helped me and that teamwork and the comradeship was unbelievable. Those experiences were unbelievable. But there needed to be something deeper, and, and, and there came that awakening at a similar period that I needed to stand up and speak on behalf of the mm-hmm. oceans and, and to actually be a proper uh, uh, an ocean advocate. And I was very, very lucky because I had this maritime law background. And so now what we're doing now, what keeps me driving every day is to try and create enormous national parks in the world's oceans or to spearhead this movement. So... Uh, the ocean, less than 1% of the ocean is, is protected. I mean, that compares to, to on land, almost 10%. And these big national parks on land, like the Kruger National Park and Serengeti, Yellowstone, they were created 100 years ago. But we forgot to do the same in the sea. And just because you don't see what's happening in the oceans, it makes you think that everything's okay there, or is perhaps okay there, but it isn't. Just to give you one statistic, uh, African penguins... I absolutely adore them. They are the most wonderful creatures. They're so comical. They, I just love, love African penguins. In 1900, we had between three and four million. Today, we've got about 60,000. And the thing about penguins is they're an indicator species. And what I mean by that is they don't fly. Penguins don't fly. So you can count them. They come ashore, they lay their eggs, you can count them. And you can know exactly how many there are in the oceans. And their, sh- their numbers of now just 60,000 indicates exactly what's happening in the rest of the but ocean. But why, why are they dwindling? We, we, we don't uh, eat penguin. No, no, we don't eat penguin. 
we used to, so I say we, but South Africans used to eat uh, penguin eggs uh, many years ago. Mm -hmm. That was banned because of the dropping numbers. Uh, three things are causing this. Number one, climate change. Number two, um, uh, overfishing. So, so less fish in the ocean in, for them to, to feed on. But the big, the big thing for penguins is uh, pollution, either plastic, which they ingest, or it's oil pollution. So, for example, the biggest animal rescue. This is something which you know, which this country can be so proud of. The biggest animal rescue ever done in the whole world was done in South Africa. A number of years ago, a ship called the Treasure, she sank off the west coast of Africa, spilt oil everywhere. Sankob, the environmental charity which looks after uh, seabirds down in Cape Town and around the South African coast, volunteers from Sankob cleaned 20,000 penguins. Amazing. And then they moved another 20,000 out of the way, so they saved 40,000 penguins. You know, if you think about it, I said there are just 60,000 left. They saved 40,000. An oil spill, a major oil spill, can wipe out at least half the population. Do you ever feel like you're a lone voice, though, Lewis? Mm. I mean, people are listening to you because you're doing these extraordinary mm. things, and you're always going to have people who are going to support you. But so often, you know, you're just put in a corner and seen as, I don't know, a bunny hugger, a tree hugger. People don't necessarily take you seriously mm. um, if you're pro the environment. How, how do you respond to that? I hope people take me seriously. I mean, I mean, campaigning... Well, you. We have one, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, just to say just one thing, and, and that is I'm not the only person campaigning for the environment. They're, they're, they're all too often, though, they're women. I mean, you think of all the great environmental campaigners in the world, a lot of them are women. They really are. And I think wonder that's, why. Well, I think they probably they, they care for the environment more. They see they don't want their children to, 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 to grow up in a world which is not sustainable or not safe. And so they're very passionate about it. It, it really is time for men in South Africa to stand up and say, hey, uh, we really need to protect this. I don't think that, that – so I don't think I'm a lone vo voice. I hope people take me seriously. Uh, I've spent a lot of time campaigning uh, in, in Great Britain. And I was absolutely overwhelmed recently. The Prime Minister has now announced that he's going to be declaring 31 marine protected areas or marine, marine protected zones, which are national parks in the oceans around Great Britain. <laughs> I certainly wasn't the only person calling for this. But when you hear such wonderful news, and it's a good starting point. It's a huge you, achievement. We need more. Yeah, mm. it's, it, it warms the heart and, re and it makes you realize together we can actually do this. But we must always, always be telling government, telling businesses what we want. We mustn't be, mustn't be quiet, and we must also talk truth to authority. We're going to take a quick break, Lewis. We're going to. I'm going to be talking to someone who helped you achieve many things. And um, I know that in the book you said you weren't sure how to address him. Do you call him Tim? Do you call him Professor Noakes? Do you call him? And now you've just landed up calling him prof and and i think that when professor tim noakes came into your life um and and correct me if i'm wrong he kind of changed everything because your your swimming and what you could achieve became very scientific because it became so measured mm. um he, every step of the way he started as prof i mean when we uh, started what's he now he's coach oh, is he coach mm. he's coach his friend his protector hmm. he's, he's so many things to me but i, I probably coach uh, but in the initial, when we started out, I just wanted to know this whole thing was going to be safe. And he came down to down to the Antarctic. He came to the Arctic with me uh, on two occasions to make sure this swim was safe and to also collect the scientific data. I mean, nobody had swum in water anywhere near this temperature before. This was fascinating for him. He had done lots of studies on thermoregulation, but on, on, on runners who are running, let's say, the Comrades Marathon or two oceans and the worry of overheating and not hydrating properly. Now he was an opportunity to see the other side of the spectrum where uh, he was somebody who was voluntarily going to be getting into ice cold water. And what would that be able to show him? We'll chat to him in just a moment. Hi, my name is Esvia Prinsler and I'm the HOD of IT integration at Bridwin Preparatory School in Melrose. We started using study apps about six months ago and have seen astonishing results. We were quite amazed to see how quickly the kids have been able to use study apps and the benefits it has shown with regards to reinforcing what they've already learned inside the classroom. I would highly recommend study apps for any school. Studyapps.co.za 
And welcome back. You're listening to Conversations with Nikki. My name's Nikki Severini. Great to be with you. Of course, Conversations with Nikki is proudly sponsored by studyapps.co.za. And talking to Lewis Pugh about his incredible, incredible achievements, um, we, we, we singled out a particular individual who's had a huge impact on his training and on his experiences. And I relayed in the book how he spoke about Professor Tim Noakes, um, not knowing how to address him. Would it just be uh, Tim or would it be Professor Noakes? And then uh, he concluded that it would be prof. But when I discussed it with Lewis, he said no. In fact, he sees uh, Professor Tim Noakes as a friend, but more than anything, as a coach. So um, I want to welcome Professor Tim Noakes uh, onto the show. Um, good, uh, good afternoon, Prof. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Nikki. I appreciate it. So Lewis Pugh speaks very, very highly of you. And as, as I said, so he doesn't just see you as the prof anymore. He now sees you as a friend and, and as a coach. How do you feel about that? Oh, well, I'm very flattered, but we had a fantastic period a relationship over this time so and it certainly grew because when we first met him I think we knew very little about each other but we went through these tough times together in which we risked everything and we achieved something that was important so Mm -hmm. we have that bond on that basis. I mean what did you first think about this man when he when he came into your office and he said you know he wants to swim the peninsula and will you is it possible because didn't he just want to ask you if if you thought it was possible correct and I said it was (laughs) out of my own experience because I'd helped two guys two teams swim the English Channel they were triathletes in the London to Paris triathlon in 1984 and 1985 and we took guys who were not conditioned swimmers and we got them across the channel and they, these guys re- swam in relays and uh, at least two of them were relatively poor swimmers but we managed to get this team across the English Channel and I personally swam a couple of hours in the sea so it, as part of triathlons so I knew a little bit about the physiology and so when he came to me I knew he was a conditioned swimmer he had experience of cold water swimming and I knew as long as he listened to his body and didn't try to override it too much, he'd be successful. So that was the evidence that I gave him. But I also knew he was different because the first time I ever heard his name mentioned mm. was when he swam around the, the Cape Peninsula. He ran swam around Cape, uh, Cape Point. And he came to the beach at the end of the swim and the w- waves were 12 foot tall. And they were breaking in very shallow water and they're very, very vicious waves. And he almost drowned. And this was reported in the UCT newspaper. And there I said, anyone who tries to land on that beach with 12-foot waves breaking has got to be tough. (laughs) All crazy. (laughs) All crazy. And and certainly have no fear because Mm -hmm. if you just look at the waves, you wouldn't want to be anywhere near them. And, of course, you're a great advocate of the power of the mind and the use of visualization because you say if the mind can go there, the body can go there. That's correct. We always decide beforehand what the outcome is going to be, and that's certainly what I've learned. And with Lewis, it was was very clear, certainly when we had the swim at the North Pole, that he just had to make his mind certain that he could do it because we'd had this training swim which had not gone very well. And two two days later, he had to get in the water again and go for three times as far as he'd managed two days earlier. (laughs) So that was... Mm. That was a big mental challenge for him. Did you ever doubt that, that he could do it? No, because I wasn't going to let him get back in the boat anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> we would have fended him off <laughs> if, he'd, if he tried to get back in the boat. And I mean, we were fairly certain that, that he'd be fine. But, you know, you can't be absolutely certain and anything mm. can go wrong. But he would have had to have a very good excuse to clamber back into the boat, I can assure you. But, I mean, you turned this into uh, an experiment. It was a scientific experiment. And I'm sure that the the information that you garnered through Lewis's swims and his ability to control his core temperature, I'm sure this is something that you can use in all areas um, of of sporting. Yes, indeed. So I think when we went down, when we went to the Antarctic, you know, only one, a lady had swum in the Antarctic. We could never work out how far she'd swum because the, the, it wasn't really reported the distances in the book that was described. And she was a completely different body shape than Lewis. She's a really very large lady, so she's a lot of insulation. So, And otherwise, no one had ever swum at those temperatures for any duration. So, and what we did find in the swim at 
at Deception Island was that he 30 minutes was the absolute maximum that a, a highly competent swimmer can last under those conditions of water temperature with two to three degrees centigrade. And he reached the absolute limit of his tolerance. And his, at the end, his body temperature was dra- dropping quite dramatically. Mm. And we realized that uh, another 100 or 200 meters would have been too far for him and he would have gone unconscious in the water. So we were able to show that if you're ever going to swim in cold water, you must be out within 30 minutes or you risk dying. Mm. And I think that was, that's an important contribution to the scientific literature. And uh, are you going to be a part of his uh, future endeavors, uh, Professor, or are you just going to be watching from the sidelines? No, no, I'll always be advising him. And uh, so I look forward to working with him with his new challenges. And certainly we've already been talking about them and discussing diets and nutrition and training programs. But he'll obviously take a lot of other advice, but Mm. I'll always be there in the background to make sure that He's getting the correct biological, physiological advice. That's fantastic. Professor Tim Noakes, thank you for your time. Lovely, lovely chatting. Thank you so much. Take for care. Me. Thank you. Yes. Professor Tim Noakes, South African Professor of Exercise and Sports Science at UCT. Welcome back. Um, you're listening to Conversations with Nikki, Nikki Seberini here. And I'm having a very interesting conversation with maritime lawyer, pioneer swimmer, ocean advocate and leading inspirational speaker, Lewis Pugh, who is uh, traveling around South Africa promoting his brand new book, 21 Yaks and a Speedo, How to Achieve Your Impossible. And I, I want to talk before we get to the book, I want to talk about the swim. There were many swims yeah. that we know, and you achieved so much. I mean, I, I love the fact that you've, you've swum Lake Malawi. Yes. I, I love the fact that you, <laughs> when I read in the book that you, you know, people said avoid the hippos. Be yeah. very careful, and if you're in the shallow end, just swim as fast as you can. And you swam so fast that you swam in a semicircle. I think your one arm was stronger than the other. So you, you, you've, you've, you've achieved, and I've said it again, really, really, really incredible things. But yeah. I, I want to focus on that particular swim, the the swim of all swims, if mm. maybe you would describe it as the swim of all swims, and that is your swim at the North Pole. How, mm. how did you get to the point of deciding that this this is this is the Everest? Mm. Well, I then went to do a swim on Everest, and, and perhaps it, it, the North Pole swim got more media attention. I mean, it was a huge moment. In 2005, 2006, 23% of the sea ice cover had melted away. So there you've got a person who's swimming across the North Pole. And, and not just a, you know, we didn't want this to be a stunt. We wanted this to be a proper symbolic swim, so a kilometre. You know, what does this say about this, the, the health of our, of our oceans and about climate change, that mm. somebody should be swimming with a place which should be frozen over and has been for many, many years? But the, the, the swim actually on Everest was technically much more challenging because not only have, had a, was the water freezing cold, a little bit warmer than the North Pole. The North what Pole, was the temperature? So North Pole was minus 1.7. So mm-hmm. salt water freezes below zero. The uh, the one on Everest was at two degrees. The problem with the one on Everest is that you're at altitude. So we're at five and a half kilometers above sea level. So very very difficult to breathe up there. Mm-hmm. And when you got that 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 when you got cold on the one hand and very little oxygen on the other hand, that's a lethal cocktail. And, and nobody had done a swim anywhere near there. The wonderful thing about swimming on Everest, though is that there are no hippos, there are no sharks, there are no crocodiles, there are no leopard seals, and there are no polar bears. So it feels <laughs> safe from that point of view. So which, which did you enjoy, the, the, the Everest or, or the North Pole? The huge challenges. The, the, the did you enjoy either? I mean, I'm talking about enjoy. I, I would say that I enjoyed Everest more. Um, ever since I was a little boy, I, I thought that I was would be going to Everest one day. <laughs> And when you're walking along that pathway, so it was a two-week trek to get to Everest, and when you walk around that pathway and suddenly in front of you is Mount Everest. I mean, it's, it, it's just an enormous mountain and, 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 and a beautiful mountain. I mean, there are more beautiful peaks than, than Everest, but she is a beautiful mountain. And there is so much mystique. And the Nepalese people, the Sherpas, are pound for pound. I've never met a group of people who are so strong. They carry all the equipment up there. The equipment which they can't carry, they put on yaks, but they're so humble. Hence the name, the hence, title. Hence the the name. yaks have appeared. Yaks have appeared. <laughs> and, 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 and so this book, the, the title, is, is an unusual title. I was out late one night. I was feeding the yaks, and 
This one yak had been working very, very hard because it had carried the boat up Everest. It would be fair to say that nobody's carried a boat up Everest before. There's no road up Everest. You can't take it on the a yak, trailer. The yak took your boat. A yak had to take this boat. So it was, a, it, it was an inflatable boat which we had uh, uh, assem- uh, unassembled and put on the back of a yak. And it had been strong. It had gone over some very, very rickety bridges. It had been courageous. It had carried on going all day. And I thought, those are qualities I can really relate to. And then later we were speaking to the team and asking ourselves, you know, what are the qualities we most admire and we came up with 21 of them. And so these were the 21 short stories about 21 expeditions. And we hope that we can relate these experiences, or we hope we do relate these experiences to, the, to ordinary folk like you or me and whatever you're trying to achieve. Lewis, when you when I mean I love the, the the 21 stories and I'm just going to highlight what's what's in here. Um, you you cover channel because with so just to repeat each each story is a yes. message because even throughout this interview. When you talk about a story, you always say, and what I learned from that was, mm. and what I got out of that was. Yeah. So I think that's very much how you see the world. You know, yes. there are experiences, and you gain, and you move forward. And you've taken that, and you've taken your love of storytelling, and, of course, your fantastic experiences and achievements, and you've put it all into one book. Yes. So you've got Channel, you've got, and Channel was when you swam the English Channel, and Fuspate, and that's when you're talking about when you were training yes. um, for the uh, SAS. Escape, visualize Mind, blame, believe, push, follow, grind, test, open, hope, break, strive. Mm. And with each story, you're talking about a personal experience. Mm. So the readers can really go along that particular journey with you and take that extraction with you. Um, And I asked you, and we're still going to come back to the swim because I still want to go there. And we've still got uh, too many questions I have to ask. But, uh, But I wanted to ask you. Revisiting that when it comes to writing a book, mm. everything seems to be so incredibly clear in your mind. Um, is it because as you were having the experience, you were repeating it? It's almost as if you were repeating it so that you could tell other people. How, how did how how do you keep such do, such Do you remember that quote memory? which you gave from Einstein mm-hmm. as we started this interview? Mm-hmm. Sometimes these things become clearer later on in life. Mm. But I do remember each one of those swims. I remember them very very vividly. I mean, they're, they're such intense moments. Let's go to that North Pole swim. You imagine you, you, you walk across the, the sea ice. I remember looking into the water. It's, it's com- black. It's completely black. They call it the black ocean. I've never, ever seen water which looks so frightening before. It's four and a half kilometers to the bottom. The water's minus 1.7. There's a wind blowing. And now you're going to dive into that water. And you know that that water is seven degrees colder than the water in which the passengers of the Titanic perished. You better have a very, very strong reason for getting in there. So what did you do? How, how do you train your mind? We talk about the thermal heating. Mm. You talk about, uh, and that's what we want to talk to Professor Tim Noakes about, is yes. the ability to raise your own temperature. Yeah. So is that something that you're able to do? You've got a fantastic team. You spoke about the importance of your team, your mm. friend David, um, the, the positive talk, you know, your visualization. Yeah. But h- h- how do you achieve something like that? And I'm, I'm asking this question because every single day we're faced with challenges. Mm. We, we all have dreams and we all have desires and they're things that we all want to achieve. Mm. But perhaps some of us are held back because we think we can't really do it. Now, physically, if either, if any of us really jump into those waters, we, we'll be dead in a couple of mm. seconds. But you took your body to a completely different level yep. by using the power of your own mind. Mm. Uh, let's just take one step back, and that is the core message from this book is that there are very, very few things which are impossible to achieve. Uh, you know when I hear people say, oh, nothing's impossible. Well, with respect, that's bollocks. There is no ways that I am going to uh, be able to run 100 meters in under 10 seconds. There's no ways I'll become <laughs> premier of China. You know what? I actually don't dream about doing those two things. But if you've got to dream about something, I think you also have the capability and the capacity to actually do it. The two go hand in hand. You wouldn't have that dream unless you had that capability. And this book talks about how to put all those things together. How do I get my mind right just before I'm going to go to the North Pole? The only way you can do it is to focus on the why. Why are you doing it? And the second thing is you've got to break these things down into manageable chunks. I remember just thinking, oh, this water, it looks so frightening. And David Becker, my coach, he quickly ran up to me. We had people from 10 nations in the team, and we had brought all their national flags with us. We were going to put them all the way around the North Pole. He said, hold on, Lewis. I'm going to put one of those flags at every 100-meter mark, and all I want you to do before you get into the water, 
is I just want you to, when you dive in, I just want you to swim 100 meters. You get to the first flag, slow down, and think about all the men and all the women from that nation who have inspired you so much to be here today. And then carry on, do another 100 meters, do the same thing, and so on and so forth until you get to the end. It's crushingly obvious that the idea of swimming a full kilometer is impossible. You need to break these things down into manageable chunks. And so sometimes people have these dreams, and they look at them, and then they get overwhelmed by them, and then they they don't push themselves. Mm -hmm. Just work out the plan, assemble the team, and then just take the first step. And eventually, I think this is the one lesson which I took away from the English Channel. Mm -hmm. I mean, the English Channel is a long swim. For me, it was nearly 15 hours. But as long as you take one stroke at a time, eventually you will re reach France. It's and you simple. also you also say something in the book. It's I've, I've written it down here. Something about don't give up because if you give up, mm. it can become a bad habit. You say something like that, and I just that really st stood out for me. Yeah, you know, all too often the in book's life, full of those. Huh? Full all, of too, all, all too often in life, and, and myself included, we give up, and often we give up at the eleventh hour. And when we do that, there are a number of long-term consequences of doing that. The first thing is, we, you, you know, you've wasted all 11 hours. The second thing that happens is you just want to kick yourself because you're so close to achieving your dream. But the third thing is the most long-lasting consequence, and that is that quitting can very, very easily become a habit. I try to, whenever I start something, to absolutely finish it because when you finish it, it gives you, it's empowering. You say, well, I have achieved that, and therefore I can do a little bit more next time. When you quit, it's doubly difficult the next time. You nearly quit, though, um, because no, you had a trial, didn't you? Mm. you? You jumped into the water. It, it was incredibly cold. Your mm. body responded. Your fingers swelled up. Yeah. What, what, physiologically, what actually happens when you, when you jump into this ice-cold water? Well, h humans are made, the majority of us is, is water, and when water freezes, it expands. And so the actual cells in my fingers uh, froze, and they expanded, and they burst. In in incredibly painful. But, and, and, but when these things happen, and just trying to take a bigger macro mm. picture, we will all, every single person, will go through times in life where things don't go according to plan, where they fall. And we used to have a, a saying in the SAS, it, it, you know, it was this, they, they used to say that uh, self-pity is a weak man's emotion. And it's so true that when you start feeling sorry for yourself, that's when everything's going to go wrong. Somehow, you've got to find it deep within yourself to stand up, and keep taking the next step forward and just keep taking that next step forward. How do you know when to give up, though? Yeah, this is an interesting thing because one of the, one of the, uh, one of the chapters we talk about perseverance. The chapter, I entitled it Fussbait. I just love the word Fussbait. There's a difference, and, and if you speak to anybody who's achieved anything in life, they will say to you that Fussbait determination was absolutely critical. Nobody has a smooth path to achieving anything in life. But there is a difference between, you know, sometimes in life, phosphate determination, so let me just try to be more eloquent, is a double-edged sword. Taken to the extreme, it can be very, very dangerous. There's a difference between quitting and letting go. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think there are times in life where you actually do need to let go. But there are other times in life where you have to take the bull by the horns, bite your teeth down, and just keep on going. So the key is knowing the difference. It's knowing the difference, and you know mm. you only get that you mm. only get that knowledge. Hindsight, very often. <laughs> well, later on in life. Mm. Uh, later on in life. Yeah. So all these experiences, the fuss bait, the having people help you, the mental preparation, mm. it still doesn't it still doesn't answer my question about how your mind can actually alter on a physiological level, your body's temperature. So basically, Professor Tim Noakes was measuring your temperature mm. throughout. So I'm not just talking about the North Pole. I know you did the, the, the peninsula around the Cape yes. and all, all, that, that all, of, all of those swims. And your body temperature never dropped. In fact, um, through a lot of the, the, the mm. talk beforehand, your body temperature would rise mm. before you would jump into the water. Yes. And, and that says a lot. It, it says a, 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 a tremendous amount. People talk about the power of the mind. People yeah. talk about healing oneself. Mm. You, you know, you've proved that. I mean, here it is because... A normal person would freeze within a few seconds. Yes. You did not. It, it, this is this is a whole it's a whole interesting thing. I often get asked. People say to me, "Lewis, are, are, you, are you different from other guys?" I, I'd love to say I am. I'm not. 
Physiolog physiologically, I'm exactly the same as any other person. I just don't want to quit, though. I hate quitting. But the second thing is, is the fear. Um, that fear is so powerful. We think it's a Pavlovian response. Remember those experiments which uh, the Russian scientist did with the dog and, and, and the food? Mm -hmm. Every time I see cold, I start my core body temperature starts rising. And we just think that's just because I've been exposed to cold so many times that it actually generates the heat inside me because my body deep down subconsciously knows I've got to heat up <laughs> in order to survive in the water. Well... In the, there's a letter that you that you wrote mm. to your friend David mm. and to the professor because you didn't think you were going to make it. So can I do you mind if I read it? Yeah, Taken you from your book Achieving the Impossible. Dear Prof and David, tomorrow we depart for the North Pole. I'm very excited. I want to thank you both for coming with me on this expedition. If I don't come back, I would hate it if anyone blamed you. I'm doing the sum of my own free will. What you've done for me has been amazing. You've brought me so much happiness and joy and helped me incredibly with my campaigning. Neither my mother nor I would ever want people to point fingers at you if something goes wrong. In the event of my not coming back, I want you to show the press this email with kindest wishes, mm. Lewis. How difficult was it to write this letter? It's difficult. You know, I haven't read that email now for... I don't know, four or five years, and it it it, it brings it brings memories back. Mm. Uh, you have to mitigate. I'm not talking about you have a dream, you dive in, and you go for it. You have to mitigate against all the risk. You really do. And then you have to dive in and go for it. You can't dive into the water with thoughts of victory and defeat. When when you know when you walk up Everest, for example, you've got to leave your doubt at the bottom of the mountain. And when you write a letter like that, you realize that perhaps you're not going to come back. I mean, that letter was written before the North Pole swim. When I climbed up Everest, they were cleaning up the mountain and they were bringing dead bodies down mm. when, we were, when we were walking up there. And you realize that things could go wrong. And I just hate the idea that anyone would blame any person in the team. We all know what you're doing. We're all volunteers. And I'm just incredibly grateful that they would help me uh, in this campaign, all of them have. We've all become so passionate about our oceans over this journey for over 27 years. We've all seen them change, and there comes a time when you need to stand up. So writing the letter was very, 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 very difficult. But uh, I needed to make sure that if I didn't come back, they'd be protected. We live in this funny world where everybody wants to blame somebody mm. else, and I never wanted anybody to blame uh, Tim or David. What went through your mind the moment before you pushed your body into this freezing cold water? I'll tell you exactly what happened. I, I, I had a bit of a wobble. I remember looking into the water and thinking, if things do go pear-shaped now, how long is it going to take for my frozen corpse to sink the four and a half kilometers <laughs> Did you really think to, that? to the bottom of the ocean? And, you know, that's not the best thought to have when that's you're trying terrible. to do the, the first swim across the North Pole. But quite by coincidence, we'd arrived there on the same day that my father had died a few years earlier. Mm. And all I was thinking about was thinking about my mother and thinking if I kill myself here today trying to prove this point to world leaders, I leave her without her son and her husband on the same day. And I turned to David Becker. I said, if things don't go according to plan, I said, for God's sake, don't let me do the full kilometer. Pull me out after 500 meters. And he pulled me away from the edge of the ice and he said, Lewis, you know, if you dive into the water preparing to swim a kilometer, but also thinking about the possibility of getting out of just 500 meters, do you know what you're doing then? And I said, and I said what? And he said, Lewis, you're confusing your subconscious because, because you're preparing for victory and defeat at the same time. And he said to me, there is nothing more powerful than a made-up mind. He said, I need you to make up your mind right now. I need you to walk to the edge of the sea ice. I need you to believe in yourself to believe in us and I now need you to swim to the North Pole <laughs> and I walked up to the edge I said a short prayer and then I just dived in it's incredibly powerful mm. and when you came out were there thoughts flooding was it just survival was it I made it was it wow or was it nothing it, it, all you want is you just want to get into a hot shower so it was straight back to the expedition ship. There is that absolute craving. You just need to be hot. It's, it's, and I couldn't believe that my hands, uh, which had been so badly damaged in a test room three days beforehand, were still okay. 
uh, and we raced from the water onto the ship straight into a hot shower. And I remember that feeling as I turned on that hot shower. And and Tim Noakes just put it on full blast and at boiling ma- hot was at maximum b- temperature. Really, this was a thing. Isn't about that a shock to your system, well, th- though? This is the thing, you know. Tim is Tim is he, he's a courageous man, and he challenges beliefs. Now, my father had been a surgeon. Uh, in the Second World War, and a Royal Naval surgeon, and all the experience which they had, they were saying, when you get so often the German U-boats took out, you know, Royal Naval ships or took out Merchant Navy ships. Mm. The guys were in the water, and they always said, when you heat somebody up, heat them slowly, so it's not going to be a shock to the body. Tim Noakes, through a series of experiments, realised that this was utter nonsense, and he put that, put me into a hot shower, put the boiling hot water on. Well, I tell you something. But so it wasn't burning your skin. Because I've thought we, about We it. could speak for another hour about how pleasant that shower really? was. It was the most incredibly wonderful <laughs> shower I ever had. I was in that shower for 50 minutes, 50 minutes, and it was just... Bliss, the best ever. We, Ecstasy. We reached a bliss point after about two seconds. It was wonderful, yeah. And, and then we got out, mm. and then we went down to the dining room, the whole team, and we sat there. And we ate a meal. What did you eat? Uh, that had to taste good. It, it, it was fish. Uh, and, but I just remember just how how very, very relieved we all were and how how happy we were. You mm. know, when you do these swims, they're dangerous. And we'd done it. And it was a world media, I mean, it was a world media event. You know, we had people, Larry King phoning the boat looking for the first interview. You know, it was CNN and BBC and it's live the North Pole, and there I am standing on the upper deck of the ship with a satellite phone, you know, in my hands. And we were just relieved mm. and happy. Mm. Things could have gone a different way. On the day, though, we, we did the basics right. Yeah. And here you sit. Mm. Have you done any damage to your body? I mean, no. if, you, if you did that to your hands, have you have your hands recovered completely? Yes. Every, Everything's working. Everything's in good working order. Thank you. And the next challenge, I'm sure everybody asks yeah. you that question, but how do you beat swimming in you know, Everest and, and the North Pole? Bake, uh, th- bake a cake. <laughs> <laughs> the, next, the next expedition is, is just on another scale altogether. Mm. What is it? And uh, Well, we're keeping quiet about oh, it at the no. moment. But, Come but, on, Lewis. But what, what I would say is that, I mean, it's for a three-year expedition. So, you know, three years is a long way, a long time to go into the world's oceans. We're going to the most remote parts of the oceans campaigning for national parks. And we're going around the whole world to the the, the big hot spots around the world to campaign for these things. But I'm so excited about it. I just... uh, You'll be gone for three years. Yes. It's a long time. It's, it's, yeah. Every expedition. No, Nikki should be three years. Really? (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm I'm very, I'm very excited about it. And uh, my whole family is as well. We're all, we're all... You know, there comes a, there, I think there comes a moment in your life where you say, I'm either going to do something now or I'm not, and I'm going to let it slip. And I, I don't want to live life with, with regret. I've seen the oceans change, and I want to stand up now. And to do something as physically robust as this, you know, I won't be able to do it in a few years' time, so I need to do it now. So projecting into the future is very important, mm. having a goal, having a dream. Yes. So people need goals and dreams. Yes. But you need to be very much in the moment. Yep, yeah, you need to be switched on. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're taking it, you're, you're, you're thinking ahead, the three years expedition. Yes. But you're taking one moment at a time because one challenge at a time. Yes. How do you marry the two, though? I'm, I'm just, for people listening, how, how does one marry the two? It's interesting because I was at the World Economic Forum the other day and there was a businessman from, from the DRC and he'd been hugely successful. And somebody was uh, having a chat with him and I was over listening and, he, and, and the he asked uh, this businessman, he said, what was his success? And he said, when you go out in life, make sure, okay, uh, j- just just take one step at a time. Mm-hmm. You don't have to see to the top of the staircase. So you know what your dream is. But some you're climbing people, the staircase, Yeah, so, so, but it's one step at a time. Yeah, you're climbing the staircase, mm-hmm. but it's one step at a time. So some people, they need to see all the, all the stairs in order to start the climb up the staircase. And he's saying, no, don't do that. You know you're going up the, up the ladder. Just take each step at a time and just keep moving forward and keep climbing. And don't try to join all the dots. Lewis, what do you want people to get out of your, your new book, 21 Yaks and a Speedo? I, I would love people to come away with, with, with this. I'd especially love kids. 
who, who read this book. I mean, this book is for, is for businessmen and women. It's for, it's for sportsmen. It's for athletes. It's, but I especially want uh, kids to read it. You know, it's coming up to Youth Day now. And I'm always asked, you know, what is the most important one of those chapters? And I'd say it's the following. It's, it's so important that you f- do in life what you love, what you're passionate about. Uh, and at the same time, do what you're really good at doing. And where those two things intersect, that is your destiny. For all too often, people are not doing what they really love doing, and they're not doing what they're really good at doing. And the consequence of that is that you're going to get to the end of your life and you're going to realize, gosh, I was following somebody else's dreams. And worse still, I had all this talent because everybody's got talent and everyone's got gifts, but I didn't use them. Lewis, thank you so much for joining us today and for taking time out. I know you're very busy, um, so it was lovely having you in the the studio and and conversing with you and uh, wishing you all the very best with your three-year expedition. And um, just to say, you know, the book, I I presume, is available at all uh, major book retailers, 21 Yaks and a Speedo. And um, they're, they're fantastic quotes inside wonderful, wonderful stories and it's the kind of book that you're going to pick up, you're going to read you're going to put the story down and you're going to think about it long Mm -hmm. and hard until you read the next one it was fantastic, loved having you in the studio thanks so much, thank you Lewis so I do hope that you enjoyed the show today, Um, Lewis Pugh who has really, literally achieved the impossible um, get his book, 21 Yaks and a Speedo and also the first book Achieving the Impossible and be inspired Inspired, be motivated, and I hope that you were entertained as well. For me, Nikki Seberini, until next week, have a wonderful one. Conversations with Nikki was brought to you by studyapps.co.za, South Africa's leading education app for tablets.